thank you very much for, um, first of all, for inviting me here, uh, but uh, second, for that uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I feel as if um, there's no way that I'll, I'll be able to live up to that um, introduction, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, so uh, today's talk um, is entitled, What are the Boundaries of Addiction? And as with all of my talks these days, I have a series of disclosures uh, with respect to uh, relationships with uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies, uh, with the gambling industry, as well as uh, legal consulting. So with that out of the way, I would like to focus on the, um, the clinical aspects and the science of addiction. And um, for me, it is helpful to think about this from a historical perspective. And if we think about the term addiction and how it's changed over mm -hmm. time, I think uh, that can be insightful. Uh, so the, the word addiction is derived from a Latin word meaning bound to or enslaved by. And in its original formulation, it was not linked to uh, substance use or substance use behaviors. Um, however, over time, um, going back several hundred years ago, uh, it first became linked to excessive patterns of alcohol use, um, and then later to excessive patterns of drug use, such that by the time uh, individuals on um, the experts in the field in uh, addictions and substance use disorders uh, were contemplating in the 1980s the revision to um, substance use disorders criteria uh, for DSM-3R. There was, um, by accounts, uniform agreement that uh, addiction meant compulsive drug use. Um, however, I think that over the past 10 to 15 years, uh, that notion has been uh, challenged somewhat and people um, have been thinking about whether addiction might apply to a broader range of behaviors outside of substance use behaviors. Uh, so in the uh, 1990s, um, Howard Schaefer and others um, proposed uh, several <coughs> core elements of addiction, uh, such as continued behavior despite adverse consequences, diminished or lost control, or a compulsive engagement in behavior, and a, a craving or an appetitive urge state immediately prior to the engagement in the behavior. And if we think of these as the core elements of addiction, uh, perhaps addiction could encompass uh, non-substance use behaviors. Another way of thinking about addiction uh, that I think has gained popularity over the past decade is to think of addiction as a disorder of uh, misdirected motivation um, or as motivation gone awry. And, and uh, by this, uh, I mean that uh, priority is given to specific motivated behaviors, particularly those that have um, immediate short-term rewards like uh, drug use. Um, and less priority is given to other motivated behaviors, uh, such as occupational or familial functioning uh, uh, or familial um, activities uh, that um, may be associated with uh, delayed gratification or delayed reward. So from this perspective, um, understanding uh, motivated behaviors and the biology and the neurobiology underlying motivated behaviors uh, might help us understand addictions and uh, develop more mm. effective uh, prevention and treatment strategies. So some of the changes that um, have occurred over the last decade, I think, um, are reflected in the literature. And two articles that I would point to are uh, ones that Constance Holden uh, authored for Science, the journal Science, um, one in 2001 and one in 2010. The one in 2001 um, was titled Behavioral Addictions, Do They Exist? and um, focused on the question of whether uh, by using brain imaging uh, techniques, uh, one could look for uh, whether uh, non-drug behaviors uh, like gambling, exercising, overeating uh, might share uh, biological similarities uh, with substance use disorders uh, like alcoholism or drug addiction. Um, in 2010, uh, the article that she authored uh, was entitled uh, Behavioral Addictions Debut in Proposed DSM-5. Um, and uh, this reflects the proposal by the uh, Substance Use Disorder Work Group Committee uh, to move pathological gambling uh, together with uh, substance use disorders like 
uh, substance abuse and substance dependence into a category of addictions and related disorders. And um, that work was in part driven by um, uh, not only uh, clinical and phenomenological similarities between the disorders, but also um, biological, neurobiological similarities in some of that uh, work I'll be discussing later today. However, if pathological gambling is going to be moved in the DSM uh, from uh, its current home uh, to one with substance use disorders, that means that it's not currently categorized with substance use disorders, raising the question, uh, what is its current home? And it currently resides in a category called impulse control disorders not elsewhere classified. And um, as this name suggests, uh, this is a rather heterogeneous grouping of disorders um, that uh, arguably didn't fit well within the uh, current classification system. It includes pathological gambling, kleptomania, pyromania, intermittent explosive disorder, uh, which is uh, problems with aggressive behaviors and uh, acting impulsively um, in an aggressive fashion. Uh, trichotillomania, which is uh, repetitive or interfering uh, patterns of hair pulling, as well as a, an impulse control disorder, not uh, otherwise specified category, uh, that currently could be used to diagnose um, uh, compulsive buying or compulsive shopping, uh, non-paraphilic uh, sexual behaviors, compulsive sexual behaviors, uh, problematic internet use or uh, compulsive computer use, as well as perhaps uh, a variety of other uh, conditions. From a clinical perspective, I would argue that these um, disorders often go unrecognized and untreated and um, may lead to uh, prolonged um, hospitalizations as well as uh, prolonged um, uh, suffering on the parts of patients. Uh, some of the data that uh, suggest that these disorders go unrecognized in clinical uh, settings come from a, a couple of studies that uh, John Grant um, uh, spearheaded. Uh, one was a study of 204 uh, consecutive inpatient admissions to an adult uh, psychiatric hospital uh, where uh, they were screened for a current impulse control disorder and if they screened positive, a follow-up diagnostic interview was performed. And that study found that over, uh, slightly over 30 percent um, had a current impulse control disorder. And this contrasted to the less than 2 percent that um, had been given a diagnosis of an impulse control disorder upon admission. Uh, a similar study uh, looking at adolescents uh, found that about 40 percent uh, screened positive with follow-up uh, confirmatory diagnostic interview. Uh, and this contrasted to the um, about 1 percent of individuals who had been given a diagnosis upon admission. So um, specifically, uh, these are data from the adult study. Um, these are the frequencies of the uh, individual impulse control disorders. Uh, the most frequently identified uh, was compulsive buying, which was um, at about 10 percent of the sample. Uh, trichotillomania uh, was the least frequently identified at uh, 3 to 4 percent of the sample. And pathological gambling uh, was identified in about 7 percent of individuals. Um, and this is um, significantly higher than in the general adult population where prevalence estimates um, typically range in about uh, the half to 1 percent um, range. Uh, of note, um, the past year estimates frequently approximated um, or were equal to the lifetime estimates, suggesting that these were active problems for people. When we looked at uh, some of the identifying um, uh, differences between individuals with and without impulse control disorders, uh, we looked at uh, whether there were differences in admission diagnoses, and uh, there were no differences for mood, psychotic, um, or substance use disorders, suggesting that these disorders um, are comorbid with a broad range of psychiatric conditions. Uh, consistently, uh, consistent with this notion, uh, 
the adults with an impulse control disorder were more likely at a trend level to have multiple uh, non-impulse control disorder diagnoses, so they were more likely to have frequent uh, comorbidities, um, more than one uh, axis one disorder. So this highlights the importance of assessing um, for uh, co-occurring disorders, as was mentioned in the introduction. Uh, amongst the adolescent sample, uh, the presence of an impulse control disorder uh, was associated with um, internalizing disorders like mood or anxiety disorders. Um, there were um, high levels of externalizing disorders like substance use disorders, conduct disorders, in both the groups with and without impulse control disorders. And the most robust um, uh, finding from a statistical uh, standpoint was with prior hospitalization, uh, where uh, the group with impulse control disorders were uh, more likely to have hosp been hospitalized previously, suggesting that this is either a, uh, a more severely ill group of individuals or perhaps that not uh, targeting the impulse control disorder in treatment might lead to um, recurrent hospitalizations. Uh, the adolescents, as compared to the adults, had a different pattern of impulse control disorders, uh, with intermittent explosive disorder being the most frequently um, identified. Uh, and that's shown here um, for the overall um, adolescent sample, um, broken down uh, by gender. Uh, we found that there uh, was not a statistically significant uh, difference between the boys and the girls with respect to uh, the um, frequencies of the impulse control disorders overall. Uh, we did, however, to our surprise, um, find that uh, pyromania and uh, compulsive sexual uh, behaviors were more frequently um, identified in the girls as compared uh, with the boys and the extent to which this reflects um, the nature of the sample um, adolescents who are um, being hospitalized for mental health care versus what is found in the community, I think warrants uh, additional study. So data from the uh, community um, find that uh, problem pathological gambling as well as subsyndromal levels of gambling, those that do not meet the diagnostic criteria for pathological gambling, um, there are high rates of co-occurrence um, with a broad range of psychiatric disorders. So these are data from the um, St. Louis site of the epidemiological catchment area study, and what are shown are odds ratios with 95% uh, confidence intervals. So um, numbers greater than one uh, reflect um, higher odds of having a co-occurring disorder um, in the problem pathological gambling versus non-gambling uh, groups, and then the uh, recreational gambling versus non-gambling groups. And one mm -hmm. can see that uh, these stars indicate a statistically significant um, uh, elevated ratio. And uh, for a broad range of disorders, internalizing disorders like major depression, uh, dysthymia, uh, externalizing disorders like substance use, um, behaviors and disorders, and antisocial personality disorder, as well as psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, there are elevated odds um, for these um, uh, disorders and behaviors within the uh, more severe uh, gambling group. So for um, a good part of the talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the relationship between uh, pathological gambling and substance use behaviors and disorders. And there are, um, there are data to suggest that there are similarities across a, a number of domains, high rates of co-occurrence, uh, both in population and clinical samples. There are similarities in the clinical courses of the disorders with high rates in adolescents and younger adults, uh, lower rates in older adults. A telescoping phenomenon that was initially described for um, alcohol use and alcoholism, um, later for uh, drug use um, and drug use disorders, appears applicable to gambling behaviors as well. Uh, specifically, uh, this telescoping phenomenon is that 
Uh, women, as compared with men, tend to initiate engagement in the behavior at a later point in life, but the time frame between the onset of engagement and the development of a problem with the behavior um, is foreshortened or telescoped in uh, women. There are also similarities in the clinical characteristics. Some of these are reflected in the diagnostic criteria for pathological gambling and drug dependence, and these include aspects of tolerance, withdrawal, repeated attempts to cut back or quit, and interference in major areas of life functioning. Some of the um, important um, elements, or what we think are important, um, are not currently reflected in the diagnostic criteria, and these um, include appetitive urge or craving states that um, may immediately uh, precede the engagement in the uh, addictive behavior. And then there are also similarities in the underlying biologies, um, both with respect to uh, genetic contributions and neural contributions, and I'll talk more about those later. Um, and some of that, that similarity might be reflected in uh, treatments. Um, and as there are similar uh, treatments that appear to have um, efficacy for uh, substance use disorders and um, problem pathological gambling. These include self-help approaches like um, Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, Gamblers Anonymous, uh, behavioral therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement, as well as brief um, targeted interventions. And then pharmacotherapies like opioid antagonists like naltrexone and nalmefene. So um, in thinking about the relationship between pathological gambling and substance use disorders, there may be some common elements that link the two. And um, these are a few Yu-Gi-Oh cards that I scanned in from my son's Yu-Gi-Oh card collection when uh, collecting these cards occupied a large part of his motivational behavioral repertoire. And, um, on, on the left, we have Mr. Volcano, who's a seemingly uh, mild-mannered creature who has an extremely volatile temper. And he might be the type of person who rushes recklessly into certain behaviors, or might be considered impulsive uh, by nature. Uh, and so one of the uh, thoughts that we had was that perhaps there are these features like impulsivity uh, that might warrant investigation as intermediary uh, phenotypes that might link the co-occurrence between uh, pathological gambling and substance use disorders. With this in mind, um, we uh, looked at uh, some definitions for impulsivity, and one that was forwarded by Jerry Muller and colleagues now about a decade ago uh, was a predisposition toward uh, rapid, unplanned reactions to internal or external stimuli with diminished regard to the negative consequences of these reactions to the impulse of individual or to others. With this in mind, I think there are several important uh, features. Uh, one is that uh, there are shared elements between the core uh, features of addiction and this definition for impulsivity. Uh, for example, uh, the diminished regard to the negative consequences uh, that um, Howard Schaefer and others um, have described. Second is that impulsivity is relevant to multiple psychiatric uh, groups, um, including individuals with impulse control disorders and substance use disorders, but not limited to those groups, and might explain a broader range of uh, co-occurrence between pathological gambling and psychiatric conditions. And then third is that impulsivity fractionates into multiple components. When people have done uh, factor analyses of impulsivity-related measures, uh, they typically identify two or more factors. Um, two that are repeatedly identified uh, may be termed choice and response impulsivity, and having both self-report and behavioral measures of uh, these constructs uh, we think will be important in terms of mapping them onto uh, clinical conditions and uh, their treatment. And then um, another um, area that uh, we've been interested in, and I think the field has been um, moving towards, is thinking about um, how during the addiction process behavior um, might change and it might move from being um, arguably more impulsive to being more compulsive or habitual in, in nature. And um, in the way that impulsivity has been 
defined and characterized over the past decade, we think that uh, compulsivity as related to uh, pathological gambling, addictions, as well as other psychiatric disorders uh, will warrant um, similar attention. So one way in which um, uh, motivational systems in which uh, and uh, addiction has been uh, conceptualized over the past several decades um, has arguably uh, been related to uh, pro-motivational um, drive and um, uh, control systems, self-control systems. And um, several circuits, uh, such as the mesolimbic uh, dopamine system, um, have been uh, widely implicated in addictive behaviors. And uh, frontal cortical uh, systems, including um, involving both serotonergic, dopaminergic, as well as um, other neurotransmitter function, appear important in this process. Uh, with this in mind, we uh, proposed a, um, a, a simplified uh, motivational neurocircuitry diagram now going back um, eight years. And in this diagram, uh, what we proposed as a central component is highlighted by this uh, golden arrow. And this golden arrow represents um, corticostriatal thalamocortical circuits that um, Alexander and colleagues, amongst others, have described now going back uh, 20 years or so. And those, these, these parallel circuits that um, course um, from uh, the cortex through striatum, thalamus, and other uh, brain regions, uh, those that course through the more ventral components have been hypothesized to be particularly relevant to uh, reward um, uh, processing, to reward-based learning, to um, perhaps impulsive behaviors, whereas those that course through the more dorsal components of um, cortex and striatum um, appear particularly relevant to um, habitual and perhaps compulsive uh, behaviors. Uh, parsed out in blue, we, um, we hypothesized that a series of um, secondary motivational uh, neurocircuits would be uh, relevant with the amygdala and related brain regions uh, providing important affective information into the circuitry. Uh, the hippocampus and related brain regions and uh, providing important contextual memory information. What have I done in similar circumstances in the past, for example? And the hypothalamus and septum and related brain regions providing important homeostatic information relating to uh, sex drive, thirst, hunger um, that might influence uh, decision making processes and um, motivated behaviors. So um, with this in mind, we were using this as a framework for testing hypotheses um, and superimposing upon that um, roles for specific neurotransmitters um, as um, data suggested that, uh, for example, norepinephrine systems um, are particularly relevant to arousal and excitement, uh, serotonin systems particularly relevant to uh, behavioral initiation and cessation or impulse control, uh, dopamine um, uh, systems particularly relevant to reward and reinforcement, and um, opioid uh, systems to pleasure and urges. Um, understanding that these are oversimplifications and that the brain um, functions uh, more at a, a neurocircuitry level involving an interplay of these uh, neural circuits and neurotransmitter systems. With that in mind, we thought that this was um, a, an important starting point and um, focused uh, some initial work on uh, serotonin systems. Uh, there's been a long history of uh, serotonergic involvement in um, impulse control. Um, Linoila and colleagues um, uh, going back now uh, four decades or so um, have uh, implicated um, uh, serotonin systems uh, through studies of cerebrospinal fluid samples and serotonin metabolites, uh, finding uh, differences in individuals with impulse control uh, problems, uh, such as those with um, alcoholism, those with uh, pathological gambling, those with pyromania. And, and Eric Hollander and his group extended this work by um, in individuals with uh, pathological gambling looking at uh, responses to uh, serotonergic um, 
drugs and finding that individuals with pathological gambling uh, as compared to control subjects show differences in response to drugs like um, MCPP, which is a, a serotonin 1 and serotonin 2 partial agonist where differences in prolactin uh, response at a biochemical level, and then at a behavioral level, uh, finding that individuals uh, with um, impulse control um, uh, problems uh, tended to report more of a um, high or a buzz in response to the drug um, as compared to control subjects who tended to report a more aversive or dysphoric um, uh, response. Taking that uh, work a step further, one of um, his colleagues, uh, Larry Seaver and others, um, looked at uh, MCPP and fenfluramine um, responses in, under brain imaging conditions, uh, finding that individuals with impulsive aggression uh, showed relatively blunted uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortical activation um, in response to these proserotonergic drugs. With that in mind, uh, when we initiated um, some of our um, brain imaging work in individuals with pathological gambling, we hypothesized that the ventral medial prefrontal cortex uh, would um, uh, show differences in individuals with pathological gambling as compared to those without. And um, our studies, as well as those from other groups, have um, demonstrated this across a range of uh, neurocognitive paradigms um, under fMRI conditions. So, for example, uh, during the Stroop color word interference task, uh, during exposure to uh, gambling uh, related videotapes, uh, during reward processing, uh, during simulated gambling, and during performance of a decision making task, the Iowa gambling task, um, individuals with pathological gambling, or in this case, individuals with um, substance use disorders and pathological gambling um, showed relatively diminished activation of the ventral medial uh, prefrontal cortex. If we think that this might be um, related to uh, serotonin systems, then perhaps um, uh, drugs that influence the serotonin system um, might be helpful for uh, changing behaviors um, in individuals with uh, pathological gambling. And initial randomized uh, clinical trials of uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, reported some uh, positive uh, results. These are data looking at uh, the serotonin reuptake inhibitor paroxetine, uh, looking at um, uh, measures of clinical status where a uh, lower measure uh, represents better treatment outcome. And in this case, active drug versus placebo drug uh, was distinguished in the week five to week eight period um, during this trial of paroxetine, where uh, paroxetine was superior to placebo in the treatment of individuals with pathological gambling. However, the um, first multicenter uh, trial of uh, paroxetine uh, did not see a difference between um, active and uh, placebo uh, response. Here, a, um, a higher uh, level on the bar graph represents better treatment outcome, uh, looking at percentage of uh, patients who were responders. Uh, what we found was that um, at the end of the four-month uh, trial, that individuals treated with active drug um, 59 percent of individuals were uh, responders as compared to about uh, 50 percent, um, a little less than 50 percent of those treated with placebo. So um, the good news was that uh, people in uh, the randomized clinical trial were getting better. Um, the the uh, perhaps more disappointing news was that we didn't understand exactly why they were getting better as uh, the difference between active drug and placebo drug uh, was not statistically significantly different. However, we hypothesize that perhaps this may do, be due to um, individual differences, and perhaps those um, individuals who are more prone to internalizing disorders like anxiety or depression uh, might respond better to a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Uh, with that in mind, we uh, performed a trial of um, escitalopram, which is another uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitor, um, in individuals with co-occurring pathological gambling and anxiety disorders. 
And this was an open label trial uh, followed by double blind uh, discontinuation. And what's shown here is the open label phase uh, looking at a uh, problem gambling severity and um, anxiety uh, severity over time. And one sees a, a largely parallel uh, decrease in both uh, problem gambling and anxiety uh, measures. What's not shown here is that uh, randomization to active drug uh, tended to lead to a persisting improvement in um, both domains, whereas randomization to um, placebo was associated with resumption of uh, symptoms in both the uh, gambling and anxiety domains. So preliminary data, um, but um, encouraging. So uh, another uh, way of thinking about um, how to approach treatment uh, we thought might involve uh, focusing on uh, choice impulsivity and thinking about risk-reward decision-making processes as um, individuals with pathological gambling and those with substance use disorders uh, tend to perform disadvantageously on, um, on decision-making tasks like the Iowa gambling task. And um, individuals with ventral medial prefrontal cortical lesions also uh, perform disadvantageously on this task. So it brings together uh, some of our neurobiological findings. Um, also, from a clinical perspective, um, uh, individuals who perform disadvantageously on the task, such as drug-dependent individuals, uh, these, uh, the performance on the task correlates with uh, real-life um, uh, measures of functioning, like the ability to uh, hold a job. We've also found that uh, some measures of choice impulsivity, in this case, uh, a temporal discounting or delay discounting measure, behavioral measure of choice impulsivity, um, is related to treatment outcome for individuals with addictions. So um, here it's shown that um, in adolescents seeking to quit smoking, uh, those who um, were abstinent at study end versus those who were non-abstinent, those who were able to maintain abstinence at treatment onset had less shallow discounting curves. So um, they did not um, place as great a value um, on immediate versus long-term uh, rewards um, as we had uh, discussed earlier. So this um, raises questions as to what's going on in people's minds when they select uh, smaller immediate versus larger delayed rewards. And uh, Jonathan Cohen's group um, at Princeton found that the selection of small immediate rewards uh, was associated with activation within uh, the ventral striatum and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. whereas uh, the selection of larger uh, delayed rewards tended to recruit uh, more uh, dorsal cortical uh, brain regions. And um, with this in mind, um, thinking about the selection of uh, small immediate rewards, one can think about what um, is going on with respect to um, reward processing during uh, the receipt um, of uh, small immediate rewards. So we've um, uh, taken uh, Brian Knutson and Daniel Hammer's monetary incentive delay uh, task and modified it uh, to look at um, different aspects of reward anticipation. What they found in some of their um, initial studies uh, was that uh, reward anticipation uh, or working, uh, anticipation of working for monetary reward uh, was associated with a ventral striatal activation, whereas um, the consumatory or receipt phase of reward processing uh, was associated with a ventral medial prefrontal cortical um, activation. These studies uh, were initially performed in individuals without addiction, raising the question as, what, as to what is happening um, at a neural level in individuals with addiction. Um, studies from uh, the uh, Hammer uh, group as well as um, uh, the Race group in uh, Germany uh, found that individuals uh, with alcohol dependence uh, tend to show uh, relatively diminished ventral striatal um, activation during the uh, reward anticipation phase. And that this uh, relatively diminished activation of the ventral striatum appeared to um, extend to individuals who may be considered um, at risk for addiction. Uh, furthermore, some of their 
uh, recent work as, some of, as well as some of ours, um, relates this to impulsivity in that in both um, alcohol dependence and in pathological gambling, um, this relatively diminished activation of the ventral striatum uh, during uh, reward anticipation appears linked to measures of impulsivity so that the less um, the ventral striatal, act, uh, ventral striatum activates, uh, the more impulsive um, individuals are uh, by self-report measures. Um, and this uh, relatively diminished activation of the ventral striatum appears to uh, relate to uh, pathological gambling in a, a broader sense. So in uh, several studies, um, some that we have performed, some that uh, Roy et al. Uh, reported from Germany, um, we see relatively diminished activation um, in individuals with pathological gambling versus control subjects when viewing uh, gambling uh, tapes in a similar fashion that individuals with cocaine dependence versus control subjects viewing cocaine tapes um, show relatively diminished activation in the ventral striatum and uh, the orbital frontal cortex. We see this during reward anticipation um, in individuals with pathological gambling versus control subjects as shown here. And then uh, Reuter et al. found this during um, simulated gambling. And what they also found was that the, um, the degree of ventral striatal activation um, correlated inversely with problem gambling severity. So the, uh, the less that the ventral striatum activated during simulated gambling, the more severe the gambling problem. So I think these findings of uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortical differences and ventral striatal differences or less activation within these uh, brain regions being associated with um, pathological gambling uh, appears um, consistent across a range of studies. They also appear to extend um, to the um, impulse control disorder uh, literature in individuals with Parkinson's disease. So um, here, individuals with um, Parkinson's disease and impulse control disorders as compared to uh, those without impulse control disorders and with Parkinson's disease uh, during performance of a risk-taking task. Um, the group with the impulse control disorder show relatively uh, diminished activation of the ventral striatum. Uh, there is a possibility that this may be linked to uh, dopaminergic function, although this has not been tested uh, specifically. But um, a group in Toronto um, has found uh, ventral striatal differences in dopamine function, um, both at baseline and during simulated gambling or during a gambling task. And uh, this pattern is similar to one uh, seen in um, individuals with Parkinson's dis disease and dopamine uh, dysregulation syndrome, where they, where the individuals excessively take their dopamine replacement therapies. And again, uh, the ventral striatum, but not the dorsal striatum, is, is implicated with respect to uh, dopaminergic differences. However, um, just because the findings linked to the ventral striatum does not necessarily mean that uh, they are related to dopamine uh, dysfunction. Um, we have uh, been investigating serotonin uh, function within the ventral striatum, uh, specifically looking at the serotonin 1B receptor. Uh, and what we found in individuals with alcohol dependence is that they show uh, relatively um, they show increased uh, binding of a uh, serotonin 1B uh, selective ligand. In individuals with pathological gambling, we did not observe a between group difference, but we did within the individuals with pathological gambling observe a correlation between um, the binding potential and problem gambling severity. So in, in both cases, um, increased binding of the serotonin 1B receptor uh, ligand uh, was associated either with um, increased uh, severity of uh, the disorder or with the uh, disorder itself. The similarities between pathological gambling and alcohol dependence may extend to um, other areas as well. Um, these are uh, uh, DTI or diffusion tensor imaging uh, findings uh, where um, individuals with pathological gambling um, show poorer white matter integrity um, within 
uh, the uh, corpus callosum and specifically within the uh, genual uh, com component of the uh, corpus callosum. And these um, findings are uh, similar to um, other uh, substance use disorders, particularly alcoholism, in which uh, poor white matter integrity has been implicated uh, more diffusely. And these findings of uh, between group uh, differences are in part accounted for uh, by uh, co-occurring uh, lifetime alcohol abuse um, and dependence, but not fully accounted for, um, suggesting that there may be um, components uh, from both disorders contributing to the, the white matter integrity finding. And that um, brings us to uh, the relationship between alcohol use and uh, gambling. This is a precursor to a a scratch-off lottery ticket. So this is an actual piece of gambling paraphernalia that I scanned in. And in this case, one would pay 10 cents and each one of these beer steins that you would push out for the 10 cents uh, would have a number on the back and you would either receive one beer or two beers highlighting the complex relationship between uh, gambling and alcohol use at a social level. Uh, from a biological level, there are data to suggest that there are shared genetic contributions to the co-occurrence of um, alcohol dependence um, and pathological gambling. And if we think about this from a treatment development perspective, it suggests that perhaps uh, some drugs that are effective for the treatment of um, alcohol dependence uh, might be helpful for the treatment of pathological gambling. And of those that um, are approved and appear um, efficacious, we thought that the opioid antagonists like naltrexone might be particularly attractive um, given uh, their proposed mechanism of action of influencing uh, indirectly a dopaminergic neurotransmission within the uh, mesolimbic pathway from the ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens. So to date, there have been four randomized clinical trials that have found um, either naltrexone or nalmefine to be superior to placebo in the treatment of uh, pathological gambling. Furthermore, um, it's, it's not um, that simple that one can give everyone naltrexone and expect everyone to do well. Uh, there are a significant number of people who do not appear to respond well to naltrexone, raising the question that there might be important individual differences. So we look for clinical factors that were associated with a treatment outcome to either naltrexone or nalmefine. And what we found was that the um, most statistically robust finding um, for the whole sample was a family history of alcoholism, suggesting that um, perhaps those individuals who um, may be at risk for um, alcoholism um, might be the ones who um, respond particularly well to opioid antagonist treatment. Uh, we also found that uh, gambling urges at treatment onset were associated with treatment outcome, uh, particularly amongst individuals who were receiving higher doses of the opioid antagonist. We found a different uh, pattern amongst individuals receiving placebo. Um, in this case, we found that age was most strongly associated uh, with treatment response, where um, older individuals were less likely to respond to placebo. And this suggested to us that this pattern, this association with a, a family history of alcoholism was more specific to the um, active drug treatment condition. So um, this is a postcard. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, this casino is uh, long, uh, any longer in business, but it's meant to highlight the relationship between uh, gambling and mood symptomatology. And there, there are data to suggest that at a biological level, there might be uh, some relationship. So I mentioned earlier that um, individuals with pathological gambling as compared to control subjects show this difference in ventromedial prefrontal cortical um, activation during the Stroop color word interference task relating to the individuals with pathological gambling show a grading, showing greater deactivation of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex than uh, control subjects do. Um, Hillary Blumberg at our institution um, performed a similar study um, investigating individuals with bipolar disorder, and she found, um, identified a largely similar brain region as distinguishing most the individuals with bipolar disorder from control subjects, suggesting that there may be similar neural correlates between the disorders. Some of this may translate 
um, to, uh, to treatment. Um, so work from Eric Colander's group um, in individuals with pathological gambling and co-occurring bipolar spectrum disorder, largely bipolar 2, uh, found that um, active lithium was superior to placebo in a randomized uh, clinical trial um, where uh, the active drug uh, was statistically significantly uh, different both in a reduction of problem gambling severity as well as in a reduction of mania uh, measures. Um, however, pathological gambling, as we heard uh, during the introduction, also uh, co-occurs with uh, major depression. And we set to um, try to understand this relationship better by looking at the Vietnam era twin registry sample, which is a, a large sample of male twins, um, over 7,000 individuals. What we found was that there was an unadjusted odds ratio for major depression and um, uh, pathological gambling of 4.1. Uh, this was largely similar for uh, when we adjusted for socio-demographic differences. Uh, it dropped to two when we uh, modeled in uh, co-occurring or other um, psychiatric uh, conditions. So these data suggest that some of the relationship between pathological gambling and major depression is accounted for uh, by these other uh, co-occurring disorders. Um, however, a statistically significant relationship between pathological gambling and major depression existed when accounting for these disorders as well as for socio-demographic differences. One of the, the um, exciting things about twin data is that one can model uh, the data to understand the uh, genetic and environmental contributions to um, each disorder and their co-occurrence. Um, so the, in this sample, um, the estimates for uh, pathological gambling was that about two-thirds of the variance was attributable to genetic factors and about one-third um, to environmental factors. In comparison, major depression was about 40% genetic and 60% environmental in nature. But um, uh, most interesting to us was in modeling the co-occurrence between the uh, disorders, the best fitting model suggested that the overlap was due to uh, shared genetic factors. Um, in this model, entirely to share genetic factors, but these models tend to overestimate the genetic contributions. Um, however, it suggests that a substantial um, component of the relationship between pathological gambling and major depression um, may be found at a genetic level, and thus uh, there may be um, some shared biological targets um, uh, for uh, prevention and treatment development. Um, this uh, appears particularly relevant to um, women. Uh, these are data from the National Epidemiological Survey of Alcohol and Related Conditions, um, where uh, this is a survey of over 43,000 individuals in the United States. And what we found was that there was a, a gambling by um, a gender um, interaction effect for major depression, in which with increasing uh, problem gambling severity, uh, there was a difference in the uh, rates of major depression in the population such that there was a stronger relationship between uh, pathological gambling, problem pathological gambling, um, and major depression in women as compared with men. And this may relate to some of the differences in motivations that underlie um, gambling behaviors where uh, women are more likely to report uh, gambling to escape from uh, depressed mood um, as compared to men who may be more uh, excitement uh, seeking. So with this in mind, we, um, we have generated a, um, a preliminary treatment um, algorithm for pharmacotherapies. As mentioned before, uh, there are uh, a number of behavioral therapies that appear effective for people. Um, and we've based this on the presence of co-occurring um, conditions, where in the absence of uh, co-occurring conditions, perhaps um, naltrexone or an opioid antagonist uh, might be a first-line uh, treatment. Um, I did not discuss data on N-acetylcysteine, which is a uh, 
a nutraceutical or a uh, product that one can buy in a health food store, uh, but it appears to show in preliminary studies um, efficacy for both um, pathological gambling and for substance use disorders. And then perhaps um, if individuals have a co-occurring disorder or perhaps um, even a family history of a, a co-occurring disorder or a disorder, that that might be used to guide treatment selection such that um, individuals with bipolar disorder or bipolar spectrum disorder might uh, receive benefit from a mood stabilizer like lithium. Individuals with a family history or personal history of substance abuse or dependence might um, uh, one might consider naltrexone and perhaps uh, with an affective disorder um, consider a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, although the data for serotonin reuptake inhibitors, as I've described, are, are mixed. So um, I will um, quickly go through um, some uh, impulsivity uh, uh, and individual differences uh, data. Um, we, as mentioned earlier, are interested in impulsivity, compulsivity, and other aspects of self-control as um, uh, perhaps some intermediary phenotypes that might be uh, clinically relevant for uh, treatment targeting. Some data that um, we have in this domain um, is by incorporating uh, self-report and behavioral measures of um, impulsivity and compulsivity into treatment trials. Uh, if we looked at self-reported impulsivity and compulsivity in the paroxetine trial, we found that at treatment onset, uh, problem gambling severity measures correlated both with aspects of impulsivity and aspects of compulsivity, uh, particularly impaired control over mental activities. Um, we found that uh, while both impulsivity and compulsivity measures um, decreased during treatment, the changes in uh, problem gambling severity uh, correlated most closely with changes in impulsivity rather than uh, compulsivity. In a separate trial of memantine, which is a, a glutamatergic drug, uh, we incorporated uh, behavioral assessments uh, related to impulsivity, uh, such as the stop signal task, as well as those that are uh, potentially related to compulsivity, like an interdimensional, extradimensional set shifting task, um, which, uh, during which one can measure uh, perseverative errors. And what we found was that at treatment onset, um, individuals with pathological gambling differed from those without, both on measures of compulsivity and impulsivity. And um, following treatment, um, the individuals with pathological gambling did not differ from control subjects on these measures and showed statistically significant changes uh, from baseline on measures of uh, compulsivity as assessed by uh, perseverative errors on the interdimensional, extradimensional set shifting task. So uh, we think that thinking about um, impulsivity and compulsivity as it relates to treatment of pathological gambling uh, will be um, uh, perhaps one other um, new way of approaching um, matching individuals um, with uh, specific treatments. And I think I'm running out of time. Um, one other area that we've been focusing um, in on is to think about um, the neurobiology of behavioral and pharmacological treatments uh, for addictions, both pathological gambling as well as substance addictions. Um, some of this work has been done in conjunction uh, with our psychotherapy development center where we incorporate brain imaging measures into trials of uh, behavioral uh, therapies for uh, drug addiction. We hope to be doing something similar um, over time in individuals with pathological gambling. Uh, what we found, uh, for example, during performance of the monetary incentive delay task is that in contrast to alcohol dependence and pathological gambling, cocaine dependent individuals appear to show overactivation of um, reward uh, circuitry on the monetary incentive delay task. And this increased activation is related to a poor treatment outcome. In contrast, uh, at pretreatment when they perform a cognitive control task, the Stroop, uh, relatively increased activation of um, similar brain regions like the striatum and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is associated uh, with better treatment outcome, suggesting that um, perhaps there are differences uh, with respect to bottom-up processes like reward processing versus top-down 
uh, processes like cognitive control uh, with respect to the neural circuits that are recruited and their relationship to treatment outcome. We've been trying to take this a step further by using advanced um, image analysis techniques like independent component an analysis to move beyond looking at uh, specific brain regions, but instead look at brain circuits and their relationship um, to task performance, um, to uh, group differences, and to aspects of treatment outcome. And in this case, we identified six um, independent components, so functional, functionally integrated activations, um, that show differences uh, that relate to the Stroop color word interference task performance of incongruent versus congruent stimulus uh, presentation with specific um, circuits, um, uh, this singular opercular and singular motor, uh, which might um, be involved in linking regions like the insula to uh, the anterior cingulate and um, anterior cingulate to uh, motor regions are showing between group differences. Um, this um, circuit, this medial cingulate frontal circuit, which relates dorsolateral prefrontal cortical um, activations to um, anterior cingulate activations, appears particularly relevant to treatment retention, whereas those um, circuits that involve um, subcortical regions and ventral uh, prefrontal regions appear particularly relevant to abstinence-based uh, measures of treatment outcome. So it suggests that um, there are specific neural circuits that might represent um, independent targets for treatment development um, for um, addictions. Another area that we think is um, exciting is to think about other targets, perhaps um, white matter um, and changes in white matter integrity as a potential target for treatment outcome. And some of our data in cocaine-dependent um, individuals um, associates different aspects of um, white matter integrity to different aspects of uh, treatment outcome, particularly to um, uh, self-reported and uh, urine toxicology-based abstinence. And taking this approach um, to uh, pathological gambling, we think, um, could be informative. So in summary, uh, there exist multiple shared features between pathological gambling and substance use disorders, as well as other disorders um, characterized by impaired impulse control. Um, we believe that um, more research should help define the precise biological um, etiologies of both similarities and differences uh, between uh, the disorders and investigate um, clinically relevant individual differences such as those related to impulsivity, compulsivity, gender, amongst others, and that um, taking this information to the next level would involve uh, translating this into improved prevention and treatment strategies and taking those strategies out into uh, the community so that we can um, help a, a greater number of people. So I'd like to uh, thank a broad range of individuals as well as funding agencies for this work. So thank you.